everybody. Welcome to the Dead Challenge Podcast. My name is Josh. Thanks for joining me today. If you're new, hi. If you're not new, hey, what's up? This is part three of my personal story, and a lot of you have been watching that, and I really appreciate it. Lots of comments, lots of people mentioning lots of things and inspiring me. Um, so today we're going to dive into the third part of my story, which leads me up to the point of college and becoming an adult and all that kind of stuff. It's 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 compressed because this is actually the part of my life I have the least memory of, which is weird because I was older, but there's a lot going on here. And I wanted to touch on a couple things before we get started and lots to talk about in this part. Um, very interesting. The things I went through, the things uh, that happened to me after I left living with my mom. So let's go. So if you weren't here for the first part or the second part, basically just talked about my childhood, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, and um, some of my abuse, some things I left out. But I wanted to touch back on some things. I've been writing some notes as I've been reading comments or I've been watching it myself again. And a couple things I wanted to not, not fix or anything, but things to add. And I have some notes over here. But uh, one thing I do remember about living in Sussex was going to friends' houses that were normal, right? Two loving parents, normal, you know, not alcoholics and anything else. And they, you know, by today's standards would just be kind of normal middle-class homes. But I remember specifically going to people's places that had normal loving homes and feeling like what a different vibe. Have you ever been to someone's home and you're just like, I could live here forever. It's so relaxing. It feels safe. And so I just wanted to touch on that, that if you grew up in the type of world that I grew up in, when you went to someone else's house that was normal, it was really, really different. And you thought it was like, are they rich? What is so different? Uh, That just reminded me that we should never have been used to the normal of abuse and negligence, but we really were, and we didn't know any better. Um, I also have to touch on the grade eight math teacher at that same school where I was stabbed by a pencil. I remember the grade nine, grade eight math teacher. Um, I don't remember his name, but I remember me being a complete dick, right? I was super annoying. Let's get that out of the way. I was such an annoying kid because of ADD and everything else that was undiagnosed until I was 30. Um, not blaming my mental stuff for how annoying I was, but I was annoying. But I specifically remember I was disrupting the class and the teacher took me into the hallway. <laughs> I can't believe. I forgot this, but I remember him slamming me up against lockers and saying, and swearing at me. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I've never had a teacher do that before. Physically violate me. I will never forget that again. I think that teacher is probably long since passed because he was like 50 when I was, you know, 13. So, um, I do remember that specifically too. So as much as I had one or two great teachers growing up, the majority of my teachers were did not help me at all. Like, I think that'd be the case. I think in any place that you go, especially if you move around a lot, you're not going to be able to develop relationships anyway with teachers. But I, I, I always had negative experiences with teachers, not except for one, which was Mr. Malcolmson. A couple more things I want to touch on is the nostalgia of my story that seems to be resonating with people. Big wheels, latchkey kids, um, the 80s dumpster diving. I'm reading so many comments of people that are just like, I did all these things too. And what I think this is doing is resonating with a lot of people to feel comfortable with your own past. Some people don't want to talk about it. And I don't blame you, but I want people, to, I think what this is helping people to realize is that you could be comfortable with this because a lot of us went through the same thing. And that's really interesting because um, it's, it's, a lot of people are DMing me privately saying, man, I went through this exact same thing. Thank you so much for telling your story. Um, I don't feel so alone. That's it. We don't feel so alone. And I think that's really, really cool. It's like our own tribe, right? Also, one thing I did discover while I was doing all these videos is I consider myself a late bloomer, like not just puberty, but like late bloomer in, I really didn't enjoy, I really didn't get to enjoy anything good in life because we didn't have it. So when I finally became an adult and started enjoying things like steak, okay, I, in my entire life, I had never had steak. And I remember finally having a steak at the keg here locally. I think it was a few years ago. I don't know how many years ago. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like things that are normal to other people, I discovered late in life and I felt like, why did I miss out on this my whole life? Like Andre Agassiz. But I don't think that's all bad because as you get older, you get to discover these things that you never had or experienced when you were young and it's amazing. Like traveling, for example, like going, that's why I'm like, I love to travel, I'll drive anywhere. 
I love taking the kids camping. I love doing everything. I, I can pick up and go at any moment of the day. And because I never got to, right? There's certain things I never got, like good food. And now I'm really, really into really good food and just experiencing new things. And it's really, really cool. That's why I call being a late bloomer, discovering things later. And I think a lot of people are like that. And that's really cool. I think that's a good opportunity for you to discover new things. And that's, I love it. One more thing that I really want to lay out here, and I'll probably lay this out in a later video when I recap everything, is that um, victim culture currently teaches us that being a victim is like our identity. Right. The more victimized you are, what category of victim you are in is like a bigger social status. Right. And I want to let you guys know that that's really bullshit. OK, I don't I didn't, like that's crazy that if you go on Twitter specifically, there are levels of victimhood that like put you in a different social class um, and let you have a voice on certain things that other people can't because they weren't victims or they're not victims. I got to say that really the, someone wrote a comment about that, that it's this is like people will capitalize on their victimhood and say this you know as a, like people who who come at me for certain things will say as a victim of SA I think what he did or I think what he says or whatever the case may be and they get to use their victimhood to tell me what I should or should not say when I'm the victim of the same thing but I will never use that or weaponize my victimhood um to say you know listen to me you're wrong right I do realize that because of my upbringing and my my trauma that is why my voice is the way it is for kids who don't have a voice right I do realize that I do realize I have a bigger voice in that space and I should be able to but I'll never weaponize my victimhood against people stop doing that like that's really silly Okay, you're lying. You're allowing your trauma and victim and, and being a victim to define who you are. Nobody should be defined by their victimhood. That's really, really negative and weird. Should be defined by how you overcame all that stuff and who you are now. But I'll probably retouch on that later. I don't know how many parts this video is going to be, but uh, as I did my outline for this part, this only brings me up to like the age of like 21. So there's so much here. There's going to be a long story in this one. I'm trying to try to recap it, but there were so many fun memories in this space that were good. Okay. So finally we get to some good stuff. When I moved away from my mom, like I thought I was just going away for a couple of, for a week or so, right. To visit my sister. I actually spoke to my good friend last night on the phone. He's like, I watched part two and he just was nostalgia bombing. He was like, remember this, remember this. And he's like, I did not know your life was like that. I'm like, was I a bad friend? I'm like, absolutely not. You're an amazing friend. He's like, I feel like you didn't tell anybody anything. And I didn't. And I don't think a lot of people do, except for the ones who are professional victims. But it, it was really telling to me that I actually didn't tell anybody about my history because I was ashamed of it. A lot of us were ashamed of being poor. We're ashamed of growing up abused. Didn't want to tell anybody because again, those kids, like remember when I walked that old drunk guy back to the hotel, those kids weaponize that against me at school. So why would I tell them I'm abused at home? They would weaponize that too. Right. It was bad enough that I had to wear dirty clothes and shitty shoes and didn't have food or money. Um, but they would have weaponized that, too. Absolutely. Oh, your mom's an alcoholic can beat you. And they wouldn't weaponize that to make fun of you. That's that's insane to me. So I learned early not to tell anybody about anything. And so he was really flabbergasted that he didn't know anything about that about me. And he and he was like, I'm really he apologized, which he shouldn't have, because none of that is his fault. But he remembers me leaving and then never seeing me again. And I remember that being like normal for me. So, but I assumed I was coming back. And so I went to visit my sister. And again, I, I, she's not answering the phone right now, but I, we lived here somewhere. <laughs> I remember specifically this parking lot and I'm not entirely sure it wasn't up here that we lived. Okay. With, well, I came to live with my sister. This is after her daughter was born. I think two years after her daughter was born, she, ta she had a toddler and I came to stay with her and it didn't go well. Let's just put it that way. It didn't go very well because there was a moment where my sister was like, uh, called my mom and I remember them arguing on the phone and my mom's like, I don't want him here. So you just, you're just up to you now. And my mom kind of just kind of hung up on her as far as I remember. And my sister was so angry and like we fought all the time. My sister and I never got along when we were young. And she told me to remind you guys of the story of when we lived on Juniper and when we used to fight so much, this is after divorce, we used to get, we used to hate each other. But at one point my sister did stab me with a fork right here. <laughs> Stabbed me with a fork. And, uh, we laugh about it now, but that was, that hurt. Okay. And it was like sticking out. That's crazy. <laughs> Hands up. You ever fought violently with your sibling? Um, anyway, but we never did get along uh, early on. Like I would get there for a couple of days. We'd get along for a couple of days, but then I was living there and I'm a big mess. I don't know how to clean up after myself. I'm loud. I'm whatever. I'm just being a jerk all the time. But I think that's where we lived. And I remember her, 
<laughs> I'll tell you this. I remember having a car and she let me drive it without my license. And I, <laughs> so stupid. And I drove it all the way over to Prudhomme's Landing, which is that place I told you was a water park. And as we were driving home, Okay, and I don't even know how I realized how to drive. I was just I just took to it very simply. But the brakes failed on that thing and I drove it into a ditch and they had to go tow it out. Man, was she angry. I'm pretty sure that was kind of the last moment that she's like, I can't deal with this kid anymore. I she wasn't responsible. She shouldn't have been responsible for me. She was 18 and I was 17. Okay. So um I, I have to recap because a lot of my story I tell people that I moved out when I was 17. And it's sort of true. It's where I moved out here. But after I lived with her and she didn't, she no longer wanted me there, I had to move out and I was going back to church at this point. I was reconnecting with my friends and I was going to the high school here. And this is the high school I went to, BDSS. I remember it because um, I was only there for the last half of grade 12. So when I, I, I guess I was visiting my sister and then all of a sudden I was enrolled to the school because... We had no options. My mom wasn't going to send money to send me back. My sister couldn't afford it. And so I just had to kind of go and roll in school. I, it's such a blur to me what happened here. I don't know. But I do remember one specific thing about the school. Um, it was such a short period of time. But I remember the wood shop. And I built this sweet table in the wood shop. I remember that sweet table. That was great. But otherwise, this was a blur. This school year was a blur. I remember making a video in video class and drama class that we had um, with me and my buddies. Uh, and we did that. You remember that uh, Saturday Night Live skit where they're doing this? What is love? And they do this. And we did that. And it was really, really, really funny. Um, I got to touch on some friends that I made in this town. Um, I had a really, really great friend named Randy who still kind of lives in this area. Super cool guy. Uh, again, a lot of these kids were, were all kind of at the church is kind of where I ran into them. It's kind of where we made friends. Um, but growing up in the old houses, I had a friend named Colin and Colin was like my bestie, bestest friend of all time. And he had one of those homes that was really nice. They had a pool. Uh, they, he, his, everybody, his house was clean all the time. And I remember specifically whenever I had an issue or my mom was gone or I got in a fight or whatever with my mom and nothing was working out, I always went to Colin's house and Colin's mom always took care of me. She always fed me. Um, I remember coming home from school sometimes with him to eat lunch. Uh, we were thick as thieves, me and him. We would just do everything together. And he was such a great guy. He really was. And I haven't, I haven't connected with him in a long time. Haven't seen him. Have, don't know how he's doing. Um, I do know his parents got divorced and everything else, but uh, that was, he was really, really cool and a good part of my childhood, a good memory. Another kid was Andrew. Andrew was the guy with the car. Okay. His parents got him what was it, a Pontiac Grand Prix? Ooh, that was a sexy car. And he had the stereo in it with a CD player. We would just drive around listening to music. Andrew was really, really cool. There's also a friend named Sean. Uh, Sean went to the church. And Sean and I were really, really close as well. And I remember Sean and I used to drive around in his uh, Chevette. He was so old and like crazy. But we just motored around all the time listening to Third Eye Blind. It was the summer of Third Eye Blind. This is the summer of 1997. The, my best summer of all time. Okay. My favorite summer I've ever had. So it was summer of 97 and we would drive around watching movies, going to Niagara Falls, listening to music. This was everybody. And we were just, it was an amazing I'll never forget that summer. It is the summer of the best music of all time. If you've ever been to one of my lives where I play music, all that music comes from that summer. I'm talking Wallflowers, Third Eye Blind. Um, trying to think of other ones. Here, I'll bring up the playlist. I have this playlist because this is my buddy, Sean. And a couple of years ago, Sean took his own life. And so I made this playlist to remember that summer that we had, that amazing, amazing, amazing summer. And it was uh, Third Eye Blind, a lot of Third Eye Blind, Savage Garden, Jameer Quay, you remember that song? Virtual Insanity, uh, Sucks to Be You by Prozac, The Verve, Bittersweet Symphony, Save Tonight, Eagle Eye Cherry, uh, If You Could Only See, If You Could Only See The Way, by Tonic, you remember that song? I Am The Man, Philosopher For Kings, Oh, Head By A Century, Tragically Hip, Story of a Girl, Hey Leonardo, She Likes Me For Me. Oh my gosh, what a good summer. Uh, I Don't Want to Miss a Thing from Armageddon, Closing Time, Semisonic, The Fastball, Oh, Desperately Wanting, Hanging By a Moment, Lifehouse, you remember Lifehouse? So that was a really, really amazing summer of just incredible music and fun times. Oh, I'll never forget it. That was also the point 
where I, my sister just didn't want me anymore. She couldn't handle me, not wanted me, but couldn't handle me. Interesting enough at that high school with all the friends and stuff that we had, I actually got my first job, my first real job. And I went to the guidance counselor and I said, this is my situation. I am having a hard time. I live with my sister. I don't know what to do. And he got me a job at a greenhouse. I wonder if I can show you guys where that greenhouse is. I bet you I know. I could, I could take you there. I remember it very clearly. And I wonder if it's still there actually. So you got to drive over here. Where is it? Oh, it's over this way. King Street. Way down into the country area. Taking a drive with me here, everybody. Is this the street? Oh, it's over here. So I'd ride my bike. Um, and I'd drive down the street. Oh, I want to see if it's still there. This is it. I mean, it's been a while. And they've obviously expanded. <laughs> so anyway, I got my first job at a greenhouse with Dutch people. If you don't know anything about Beamsville, it is literally Dutchville Central. Okay, lots of Dutch people because Dutch people are hardworking farmers generally or they own greenhouses or whatever. Right. So I remember working my first greenhouse and this greenhouse is huge compared to what it was. It used to look like something like this, like tarp greenhouse. And we would just plant flowers and just work in a greenhouse, which is some of the hardest work you'll ever experience in your life. Okay, And it was always full of like young Dutch girls and Dutch, mostly Dutch girls. And I was like, this sucks. It was terrible. But I, but I got like seven bucks an hour and I worked there for, I don't know, like six months before I was like, I can't do this anymore. And oddly enough, another person at the church, their brother worked at this place. Uh, it was a landscaping company and it's still in Beamsville to this day. Really, really big. They got even bigger. They were really good. And I loved to landscape, which was just cutting grass, basically lawn maintenance. I didn't do any of the bricks or anything, but I just started cutting grass. And I think I got paid $8.25 an hour which was pretty good actually for that time. And uh, as high school was ending, I started working full time at, uh, at landscaping and I was really young and just working hard. I got a sweet tan. I was getting a little bit stronger. I was still fat, like obviously as a big boy, but I was, you know, I was always active. So I was working my butt off and I would spend every paycheck on stupid shit all the time like clothing, all the things I never got. I would just, I didn't know how to, no one ever taught me how to take care of my money ever. I never saved a penny ever. I don't have anything to show from that time of my life. But uh, I remember um, working, at, sorry, I remember doing landscaping and then um, m living with that family from a church. So a church, my sister didn't want me anymore. And so I moved in with this church family, right? And that didn't really work out. This family was amazing though. Oh my God, I'm looking at that greenhouse right now. That is crazy how big they've expanded. Holy shit. Um, sorry. Um, but I lived with a family at a church and this family was amazing, but they had a computer. And I never really had full access without anything from a computer. And this is when I was like 17. And so I started looking at porn on the computer. And this is something, it's kind of a, a thing that I still, I, I held in shame for a long time, specifically because I was Christian. I, you know, I still consider myself that, but I was going to church and I, I just, I just looked at porn all the time, all kinds of porn. And it wasn't, I don't consider it an addiction, but I think it was kind of, now that I look back at it, it's probably quite normal for a young teenage boy to look at that stuff. Um, but they were like diehard Christians and they had two young kids that lived there and they just didn't, you know, they didn't want that in their home. And I totally get that. Like it was, I violated their trust because I'm pretty sure we had a conversation about like, don't look at inappropriate stuff on the computer. You're allowed to use it, but don't look at inappropriate stuff. Um, <clears throat> and that was, they were so amazing to me and I just violated the trust. And that's kind of like my, I, I feel like stepping into this point where I become homeless, which is really weird, was all my own doing. This is not a sad fishing moment. This is my making a decision when I'm 17 to do something I shouldn't have done. And violating these people's trust who gave me a place to live rent free fed me everything else and just they i violated trust and it's something of, of a, still a point of major shame in my life where i'm like ah, i shouldn't have done that man i such i couldn't help myself um and no and not really an excuse for it. i mean i did grow up that was normalized in our home which is really weird again like the posters and naked ladies and all that kind of stuff but the internet was really really a man it did it change things for kids like me Right. Made, it made porn access very, very, very simple. And every, every kid I knew was looking at, was looking at it and it just was, it became normal and it shouldn't have pure and porn is very dangerous. Okay. By the way, I want to let you guys know that I do think that it is. Um, I don't ever want to shame people for doing it 
or ingesting it because it is what it is. But I think that if you do have that kind of addiction, that can be a dangerous thing. And obviously it kind of ruined my life because I, I violated trust in those people who helped me and I was screwed. So I remember specifically one day I was home and nobody was there. And the pastor came from the church, knocked on the door and said, Josh, we got to talk. And then he kind of laid it out for me. He's like, look, they found out that you were looking at the stuff and they don't want you here when they get home. And I was like, like shame. It wasn't even like sadness about like, where am I going to go? It was like absolute and utter embarrassment and shame for the thing that I did. Right. And again, this is purity culture speaking. I grew up in a church that was very, very similar to Baptist where it was like no secular music, nothing. They were very into purity culture. And I get that, right. That's, that's a church's prerogative to have that stuff. And I don't, I think purity culture is dangerous to a degree, but I also don't think that people should shame others for wanting to consider themselves or want to be pure either. Right. In the eyes of the Bible. So I was just embarrassed and ashamed of myself. And he's like, look, we don't, I don't know where you're going to go, but for now you can sleep in the church. And that's where I consider myself homeless. I had nowhere to go. I I had just had this job that I had to go to and had a bike and had nowhere to sleep except for the youth room in the church basement on a couch. And I don't know if you've ever been in a church at night after dark, that shit's creepy. It's haunted in there. It was really, really scary. It was the scariest moment of my life. I remember that first night sleeping on that couch. It was one of those old donated couches from like the 60s, right? Uh, spring sticking out and everything. And I had a, they, they gave me a sleeping bag. And I had a backpack of my stuff. And that was it. And I remember bawling my eyes out, sitting in that church basement, thinking, I am, I'm done. I'm done. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed of myself. And I can't believe I did that. And now look what you've done to yourself, Josh. You're homeless now. You, you're sleeping in a church basement. It was a really, really low. It was rock bottom for me. That was rock bottom for me. I have never felt so much shame and embarrassment in my life. And again, I don't think a ton of people, the church really knew what was going on, um, but I was really plugged into the church big time. But later on, we'll find out that they did know. Um, and so I, I stayed there. I don't know how I honestly feel like my brain blanked a lot of that out, but I don't know how long I was there for before a really, really, really good friend of mine uh, let me live. She asked her mom if I could live with them and her brother had just moved out and gotten married or something like that or gone to college. I forget what it was, but the brother was gone and there was a, a free room and they let me stay there. They didn't judge me for you know, my thing. I don't even know if they knew probably they did, but they didn't judge me and they let me stay there and fed me. Again, this is one of those moments where somebody's act of kindness and something probably that was so simple for them saved my life. I had nowhere to go. I was scared. Oh, so scared sleeping in that basement. Um, and I had nowhere to go and they open up their heart, their home and their hearts to me. And, um, man, I don't ever want to forget them. I don't want to honor them. I don't, I don't want to say a lot of names, but Jen, you and your family were amazing to me. And I just, I can't thank you enough. So many people now that I think of it really, really, really good to me and helped me along the way. And without them, I would have, I don't know what I would have done. Everybody. I have no idea. I think at that moment too, with the church, with my shame and everything was a moment I had in my life. There's two moments in my life where I contemplated suicide. Um, there was one in grade seven when that guy in St. John, remember that school that, uh, where I was the marble King, the one after Thorold. So in St. John, there was a kid there that was, that was really, really scary. And at one point I didn't want to go to school anymore, but my mom forced me to go to school and I didn't want to go. And I contemplated suicide there. Because that guy was like, I'll see you tomorrow. And like, was going to like, he said he was going to hurt me really bad. And I was really scared because everybody was with him. He had like a bunch of friends that were on board. And again, really, really hard moment in my life. That school was just, I fucking hate that school because of that moment in my life. I was, I'd never been so scared of somebody in my life. I was bullied a lot, but not like that. That was really scary. Um, and then this moment in that church, I, I had, I was at rock bottom. I had nowhere where am I going to go? I can't, I can't sleep down here. I'm scared shitless and I have nothing. I have nothing to my name. And that was a moment where I was like, I think I need to end this thing. Glad I didn't obviously I prayed and Christianity came, kicked me in the ass at that point. Jesus might've done something. And when I prayed, I don't know, but this family stepped up and let me live with them and save my life. That's what it's, I have no other way of saying that they saved my life. So, and likely they didn't even know that. I should probably tell them that, right? <laughs> 
So anyway, that was great. We uh, living there was great. They were so amazing. Um, and they, uh, I would get, I would still, I was still doing landscaping and everything else. And I remember prom was coming up. Okay. Prom was coming up and this is a good story. I want to tell you guys this good story, but uh, prom is coming up and I was going to youth group and in youth group, it's just like this big dating thing, right? Everybody dates everybody. Everybody's got like a heart, a heart crush or whatever the case may be. And I had, I, I liked this girl, um, from Welland and she was a duchy and she was a hard worker. She worked at greenhouses and farms and everything else. And I kind of had a crush on her and I kind of had a crush on this other girl and I had lots of crushes all the time, everybody. Um, but I wasn't, I was still kind of annoying, still fat ugly and everything else but I, I guess it was funny and so I did have friends and I did have some girls that were interested in me which which was I don't know why but whatever um and I remember <laughs> prov was coming up and I said I I asked the one friend the one girl I had a crush on if she'd go to prom with me because it's like hey want to go as a friend not like as a you know, not a date, just as a friend. Cause all of our youth group, we're all going together anyway. We're all going as a big group. So I said, Hey, you want to be my date? And she's like, yeah, but I think that this other girl, which was the girl from Welland, I think she really likes you. And I think she'll be upset. I'm like, Oh, I didn't know that she liked me. I'm like, Whoa. So it was a big moment. I'm like, okay, hold on. So then I go, I went and asked the other one. I said, you guys, you want to go to prom with us? And I then took two girls to prom. I kid you not. That was expensive. I took them both. But again, we went as a big group. So I just kind of maybe just added them to the group. Just kind of maybe what they thought. But I I boast about it as if I took two girls to prom because I paid for them. <laughs> but I'll never forget prom night. Okay. It was one of the most memorable nights of our lives. And uh, we stayed up all night at this person where I was staying. And we had a, we, we weren't supposed to. Like we had a sleepover with boys and girls. <gasps> Oh, if their parents, I wonder if they ever told their parents about that, but that was like the, that was a big deal. Okay. It was, wow. We stayed, we went to Niagara Falls in the middle of the night and just, we just laid on top of people's cars and we just reminisced. It was amazing. I'll never forget it. And I remember that night, people always wanted me to draw in their yearbooks. And I did a big Spider-Man in someone's. I did a Lion King in someone else's because I was always drawing. I was really good at it. And so my thing was I, people would save their entire back page for me and I would draw this elaborate, crazy picture in their yearbooks. And I did that all night and we just had a great time. It was really fun. I don't think anything untoward went on. Like we weren't drinking or anything like that. Or were they? No, they weren't because this is when we were all pretty straight edge. And I actually got upset if my friends started drinking and stuff like that. I got really upset. I held my friends to a really high Christian standard because I'm like, again, all of my trauma came from that but they didn't know that. I remember getting in a fight with one of them because I heard that they had tried drinking and I was so effing mad at them. I didn't even talk to them for like a month. I was so angry. I judged them. I judged people a lot um, for doing that stuff. And so I graduated, but I graduated from Sussex, right? So I had to go back and it was all really weird. So they just let me take the courses there and finish, but Sussex graduated me because I started there. Long story. But um, eventually summer ends, summer ends and I start dating the girl from Welland like I was it was awesome she was like I think I was her first kiss and I remember it was I think it was on a trampoline in her yard in the stars it was really romantic actually it was really romantic and we were just you know it was great it was a really really good experience I remember dancing in the rain at one point sometime I guess we were just trying to make memories and it was raining at this one park and we just danced in the rain it was lots of great memories we all all us youth group kids all we did was hang out with each other every single, I think youth, youth group was Wednesdays and we just hung out until like midnight on Wednesdays. Youth group was the thing and on weekends we all just hung out. And oddly enough, it's funny because I did have a crush on that other girl and this girl, the, the, the Welland girl and I, we broke up because, well, she broke up with me, I think, because it wasn't really working out and I, I was, I didn't really care, I think. And I remember her being pissed that I didn't care. <laughs> so after graduation, after prom, I moved into my own place on Hickson. I'll show you where it is. Oh man, this is crazy. So here it is. After I moved out with that family because I started making money, I was working full time. I said, look, I'm just going to go get my own place. I think it's time. And I went and moved in to the basement of this house. Okay. And I remember that I had a water bed. Someone gave me a water bed. <laughs> That's legit. Filled that shit up with a hose. Um, I had the table I made in high school and I had a donated couch. And that's all I had. It was just a place to sleep. I kept it clean which is weird because it was only one bedroom. And I drew on the wall a picture of Tarzan and his mom from the Disney's Tarzan. I remember that specifically. And uh, I had the place people wanted to come over because I was, I had no parents. I was, I just freshly turned, was I 18? Yeah, I was 18 and living in my own place. And that's where like, 
My buddy Brandon and I would bring some girls over sometimes, do a little makeout stuff, watch Aladdin kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that was where I lived for a little while until I couldn't, until I just, and so while I was living there, my buddy Brandon was like, look, Josh, what are you going to do with your future? I'm like, I don't know, nothing. He's like, look, I'm going to Redeemer University. You should look into it. It's, they accept pretty much everybody. It's Christian University. Uh, it's really cool. Why don't you check it out? So my buddy Brandon and I were really close to that point, And I remember him being like the hottest guy in school. Like, I'm not, I kid you not. Brandon was a straight up fox. Hold on. He was the hottest guy in school. Abs, cool hair, just really nice to everybody. I remember he would, he'd be like, girl, what's up? And girls would be like... <laughs> Brandon was like, I remember my sister like, Brandon's hot. <laughs> so Brandon was a really, really good guy. He's actually a doctor now and he's still hot. Just going to say that. But um, he's like, look, I'm going to the school. I'm like, Brandon, should I go to school? He's like, yeah, sure. So I signed up for school and with my 60% grade point average, they accepted me. And this is where we went to uh, Redeemer University, which is, I mean, it's changed since I've gone. They've got like a new indoor sports center, but this is what it looks like. And, uh, I got, I signed up for OSAP, which is Ontario student program. And I was obviously had no family, nothing. So I got full fledged, like Ontario just said, here's 20 grand. Enjoy your first year of school. Idiot who doesn't know how to do anything with money. So honestly, <laughs> I don't think that that was the best decision, but it ended up being the best decision of my life anyway. But let's go back. So I got really angry at that one girl I've had a crush on since I was like 12 years old. I think they tried drinking or something. And I was super upset with everybody because everybody's being a bunch of idiots, not being Christian. And I stopped talking to her for an entire year. And we were really, really close. All of us were really close. And that's what I did. I kind of shut people out instead of just talk about everything. And it was my own fault. I was stupid. But during that year, I was like, fine, I'm going off. I'm going to go become my own person. And I said, I promised myself before I went to school, I am going to change who I am so that people like me. I kid you not, I was very much unliked and I had this opportunity to start somewhere fresh where nobody knew me. And it was starting to mature a little bit. And I said, I am going to be someone cool. I'm going to do something big and I'm going to be loved. Right. And so when I went to the school, it was a fresh start for me. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And the most expensive thing I ever did. So I'll get to the love story in a second. But while I was at this school, we lived in the famous dorm 24, where I can see if I can show it to you guys. The school's crazy because it's like a little town. This is the dorm we lived in. This was my bedroom up here. So how this school went was, I think it was 15 grand a year just to go minus all the other shit because we lived on campus. There's all these little townhouses and there's eight people in a townhouse. And instead of having a cafeteria, there's a food store and you can go into the food store and get, I think three days a week, you can just load up on whatever you wanted up to a certain degree. And I gained 40 pounds at the school, just pounding sandwiches and eating and drinking like a liter, a bag of milk a day, like a bag a day. I gained so much weight because again, food insecurity. Finally, I had food that obviously I paid for because it was with student loan money, but I didn't see it that way. It was like free food and I couldn't stop myself. I just started eating and I got gained even more weight. I think 30 pounds, 15 to 30 pounds. I was big. But the one thing I did here, one thing that did change was become the funny guy. And I started, this is where I started playing guitar. I picked that guitar up though, by the way, because right before I left, I'd found out that that girl I had a crush on liked guys who play guitar. So what I do the next day, I bought a guitar with money. I probably didn't have guarantee probably put on layaway or like payment plan. And I bought a guitar. And so when I went here, um, I was an art major and I wanted to be an animator and they had art program, which was garbage. And they had a psychology program, which I signed up for as a psychology major art minor. I think it was, or the other way around. I think, it was, I think I switched it and I'm like, I really, really like psychology. And I took, I took developmental psychology and I was like, this is amazing. I was, I always had a really hard time in school just because of my ADD and stuff like that. And I could never learn. But for some reason I ingested everything about psychology. I loved it. Probably because I was like, this is really interesting to discovering who people are. And that teacher was incredible. Like, I think he was like a Harvard educated professor at this school for some reason. It was weird, but he was really, really good. I used to do this thing called dorm rounds. Okay. Where I would go around. So we lived in this dorm. I would go around to like 18 dorms in this whole area of people that I kind of liked. And I would, I would literally serenade them outside their window or I'd go into their house and just chat what's going on. I was so social incredibly social and people loved my visits. Like I did dorm rounds every night, like every single night. 
and some people hated me. Some people love me. Um, but I was becoming someone people liked and I really, really liked it. It was like dopamine hits hardcore in my brain. It's also the time we went down to Mississippi for a surf project to help people fix their houses. And that was an amazing memory too. Uh, we went to this place called cock of the walk in new Orleans. It was like catfish and shit like that. It was really cool. Really great memories of the school. Incredible, incredible. Um, I came away from this place completely changed completely a, a 180 different person. My faith in God was re- a lot stronger. Um, I was a good musician now cause I played three hours a day and I didn't do any school. I'm pretty sure I failed everything. Pretty sure. Except for psychology. I think I aced that. Um, and art was there and it was fine. I made lots of incredible friends to this day. I still talk to a little bit here and there. Um, but I had a really, really, really good time. It was a good thing. And it changed who I was as a man. I came away from that place different really, really different. And so I want to go back to the love story. So we leave this school is the end of the year. And I go back and my friend Brandon lets me live with them because I had nowhere to go. Where am I going to go? I have nothing. And I remember in that middle of that time, this is a different moment that I remember my mom came back and they, and she was living with my sister in this big giant farmhouse in the middle of nowhere, um, in between Stony Creek and Beamsville. And I remember coming back and seeing them. And I think I saw them for a weekend or whatever. And then I couldn't stay there. And my friend Brandon said, well, you can stay with me. You can stay with me and let me stay with him. And I remember also that moment is when I found out my mom and my sister had been using my social insurance number to, uh, get hydro phones and everything else. And I didn't find out about that till about three and a half years later, when I started getting calls from collection agencies, my credit was in the tank. And I have no idea. I didn't, it wasn't me. And they used it like to use sign up for bell Canada to sign up for hydro and electricity and everything and gas and used my thing and then just didn't pay it. And I dealt with, um, bad credit and creditor calling for the next 10 years of my entire life because they did that to me because they didn't have any money. They didn't have any credit. And so they, my mom used my, that's fraud, by the way, my mom used my name and my social insurance number to get to get this stuff because I was 18, 19, was I 19 at the time? So I was legally an adult. Insane, right? Anyway, so head back to Beamsville and I'm a different man, right? And we start going back to church and um, I start, I get another job at this place from a guy at a church uh, called Joshua Contracting and they built greenhouses. And uh, I remember it was 10, 75 an hour, which was a lot of money. And uh, it was just general hard labor. Like we would build metal structures, greenhouses, like very simple to build, but heavy. And you use sky jacks and everything else. And I remember him saying, yeah, I'll give you a job. This guy always hired kids from the church, even though we, all of us were bad, but he just did because he was a really, really good guy. And uh, he just helped us. He was a really good, he, he, he was, he was awesome. Again, another person just stepped in my life that was really good for me. And I was building greenhouses, making decent money, living with my buddy, Brandon, and uh, started going back to church and ran into the girl that I had literally ghosted for a year because she wasn't as Christian as I thought, which was so silly and stupid now that I look back on it. But anyway, I was different. I said, look, I apologize. I'm like, I'm so sorry I did that. I've learned so much since I went to school and I just want to say, I'm sorry for judging you and all this kind of stuff. And for whatever reason, something was different about me. And she, I remember her saying that she's like, and a lot of people said that they're like, you're so different. Something about you has changed and we love it. And I became someone that people liked. So anyway, the love story is long, but it's basically, uh, it became a moment where this girl finally admitted through friends, because that's how it went, that she had a that she had a thing for me. And I had had a thing for her for so many years, right? And I remember youth night, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do this. And I talked to my buddies, I'm like, what do I do, guys? She's finally admitted that she likes me, or I know for sure, and I wanna ask her out, right? I, but I wanna make this memorable. So get ready. So let's head over back to where we were. I was enamored, I'm finally like, this person I want to be. And I think I'm ready. I'm ready to ask this girl to be my girlfriend. So here's what I did. And I came up with this elaborate, crazy plan. So after youth group on a Wednesday night, I said, Hey, can you ask your parents if you're cool to come hang out and go for a walk? Cause we would always, after youth group, I think she would drop her sister off at home and then we would all come go hang out again, go do something, go for a walk, go to the park, go to the beach, whatever it was. Right. And, um, so what I did is I got her little sister and I said, when you get home, you leave this note and this rose on the front seat of the van. So when she gets back in the van to come back to church, she sees that. So it's a big surprise. So I had this elaborate plan that there was like, I think 12 different stops 
where she had to go to places we had memories at. So one was a church, one was Wendy's for Frosties, one was, I don't even remember anymore. There were so many stops. It wasn't 12, it was like seven. Um, there was places we went, places we hung out with friends. And at each place I had either a friend or I actually, when I went to Wendy's, I asked the person, hey, there's a girl gonna come with this clue. Can you give her this? And they said, yeah, it's great. And I said, can you also give her a Frosty? Here's the money for the Frosty. So it was really, really elaborate plan to, to ask her out. And this is where we ended up. So the last place it landed was like 11 o'clock at night and it was on this beach here. And she had to come down here to where I was sitting on the rocks with my guitar. And I wrote her a song and I played it for her there. And I just kind of sat in silence for a little bit. And I said, hey, do you want to give this thing a shot? <laughs> Never forget how crazy it was. Should we give this thing a shot? And she's like, oh, you know, I don't know because her best friend was a girl that I dated before. I took them both to prom. And I was like, oh, that, man, that makes sense. Really sorry. And then so I said, all right, well, let's get back. Let's walk back. I'm like heartbroken. Okay. Like I'm not going to give it away because I'm like, you know, I'm a different man now. I'm completely different. And we started walking back to the van and uh, she's like, you know what? Let's do it. And I remember, no, this was a Saturday. I remember it was a Saturday. She's like, let's do it. And I'm like, I picked her up off the ground. I'm like, yeah, swung her around. It was like, honestly, up to that point in my life was the happiest moment of my life. I can't explain to you how happy I was. It was somebody I had a crush on for, imagine I had a crush on someone for like over, you know, almost 10 years. Finally, you've become who you want to be and then everything's coming together for you. You know, you've gone to college, you've got a job, you, you're safe, you don't have to worry about your past and you finally got the girl. You got the girl. And it was amazing. I remember going to church the next day, she had pigtails, she's looking super hot. And uh, nobody knew at this point, except for my friends, because obviously they, I told them that night, but uh, yeah, we played on the worship team together and uh, she said, I gotta go talk to you know her, the other friend, and she did. And the other friend was like, that's no problem. Great, I love it for you guys. So it was a really good moment because you know, I, I felt it was a moment for me of maturity, of a place where I was like finally making it in life. It was really awesome. She signed up to go to school out in BC. I was living with my buddy Brandon. So she goes to school because we had like the summer of love. I think we had a month together of just intense, intense love. Like not like not sexual or anything, like nothing like that, but like intense spiritual. And like, we were like in love, like it was crazy. I know a teenager say that, but we were like, it was nuts. So it was just an incredible summer. I don't think her dad liked me at all. Well, I know he didn't cause I'll tell you what happens in a minute, but we, it was just really good for me. I was, I can't, it was so fun. Such a great summer. We did all these things. We had all these dates planned out before she left for school. We had them all written in a book. We would take pictures and we said we planned out our whole summer. We we're going to do these things. We we're going to do these. We we're going to kiss here and all this stuff. And it was really, really, really good. So good. It was so fun. So she's getting ready to go to school and we're crying our eyes out like every day, two or three days leading up to school. She's bawling her eyes out. I'm bawling my eyes out. We're crying. I, could, I was so, okay, so crazy. Um, it was it was similar to, I don't know how to explain it. It was that we had, it was fireworks. It was great, okay? Um, every day I tried to be better. I'm like making plans for the future now. I'm gonna go to school in Vancouver too to take recording engineering at this crazy school. I'm gonna come out and look at the school while you're at school so we can visit. Um, and it was just making plans for the future because that's what young Christians do, right? We're definitely getting married. Like there's no if, ands, or buts about it. So she goes out to school. I'm bawling my eyes out. We call each other on the phone every single day. Um, and then I make plans to go out near Thanksgiving because our, our young adults pastors, oh, I love these people, Paul and Jenny, my favorite people on earth. They were amazing. And uh, they said, hey, we're going out to Whistler. Why don't you come with us? Uh, you know, fly out with us. We'll drop you off at the school and then we'll pick you up and we'll, you know, it's just an easier way to get around. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, let's do it. Got my plane ticket. And getting ready, saving up all my money, and I bought her a guitar for her because she said she was interested in playing guitar, so I bought her that for a gift, and I wrote 100 Reasons Why I Love You in a piece of paper, and I stuck it in the hole of the guitar, so someday she might have found it. I don't even know to this day if she found it. Maybe she did. But I remember us talking on the phone all the time, too, and I'd never told someone I loved them in my life, right? Maybe my mom, but it was never something that really happened, right? Love was so foreign to me. Um, but I remember on the phone one day, she's like, you know what? This is like, I mean, this is months into the relationship. She's like, I love you. And I'm like, uh, and I hung up the phone. I was like, what? like, oh shit. I had to call her back. I'm like, I'm really sorry. And then I said the same. I love you too. And it was just like, again, teenager love. I think I was 20 at this point and she was 19. And so um, that was really funny, really funny moment. But so good out to Vancouver. 
Paul and Jenny dropped me off at the school and like, oh man, sparks. Like just, oh no, she came. Was she at the airport? Yeah, she came to the airport and just hugs. Just like, it was like my other part of me was finally reunited. I got people who have been in love uh, know what I'm talking about, okay? It was just an amazing moment. Vancouver is incredible. And she's like, let's take you around. We did the tour of Vancouver, tour of her school, met her friends, gave her the guitar. Everybody was like, this is your boyfriend? He gave you a guitar? And I was like, the flex. I saved up all of my money. So when I went there, we could just do whatever she wanted to do about our groceries, did everything we could. We went on hour long walks. That was one thing I always did. We went on walks for that whole summer, sometimes for five hours, just walked kilometers and just talked. We had never ran out of things to talk about. Get to the school. We went on this massive walk down the train tracks for hours, just planning the future. What are we going to do? It was, I remember it very vividly. And then Paul and Jenny said, Hey, look, we've got this Airbnb. We got this. It's not Airbnb at the time. They had a, I don't know what it was. They rented a house up in Whistler and I'd never been and my, the girls had never been either. And we went to stay with them. They're like, you want to come stay with us for a weekend? Um, we're like, yeah, hell yeah. So we get up there and it was funny because the, those youth leaders allowed us to kind of spend an evening together. They knew we weren't going to do anything. Like we, we were like dedicated to our Christian faith as well and dedicated to saving ourselves from marriage. Everybody kind of knew that there was no mistrust or anything like that. We made that very clear to each other, uh, made purity packs and all that kind of stuff. And they let us kind of stay. And I remember us just having an intimate evening of reading the Bible. I kid you not. <laughs> Did you not just like candles and reading the Bible and praying? It was really weird. Uh, man, was I different? And it was just a good night. It was a great, it was a great memory. Uh, amazing. And then I remember on the last night we were the last day, the last night we were leaving, I had this plan and, uh, I'll never forget it. So staying with a couple of guys in their dorm, they let me stay there. Friends of hers, really cool guys. And like, can I just, uh, can you guys help me out for something? And we went to her dorm and she lived in this, and she, her, she was like in the second or third floor of this cul-de-sac dorm. And I threw something at her window, threw something, I threw something. And I had these guys come stay at the, at the wall so she couldn't see them. And she turned the lights on. It's like, I don't like two o'clock in the morning. It's like two hours before I have to leave or something like that. She opens like, what's going on? And I start singing, leaving on a jet plane but I changed the words a little bit to add to our story. And uh, I thought people were going to be so angry because all these lights start turning on in the court. I'm like, oh shit, I don't care. I don't care though. The guys were playing guitar to amplify the music and I was singing and with my guitar. And then when I finished the song, the whole place erupted with claps and they're like, yeah, I was like, oh, it felt really good. And she couldn't come out of the dorm because it's like Christian school, you know, you know, can't just come out. And so she went, you know, that was a moment that I was like, it was really romantic and it was just basically like, I'll see you when you get back. I'll see, you know, when we, when we see at Christmas or whatever, it was really exciting. And I remember the next day she came out and gave me the biggest kiss and hug. It was really, really good. And then we went to the airport and ball and I, our eyes out on the way to the airport, just, just, just straight ruined both of us. Okay. Get out to go. And she's going to take a cab back. I think it was. And hug goodbye, kiss. I run into the airport cause I don't like I'm done. I'm finished. Okay. And I, I remember the shirt I was wearing too. It was a campus crew orange shirt. I remember it because I had that shirt for years and years and years and had butter stain on it. I remember it. And my hair was dyed white. I'll show you a picture if I can find it. I was, I was, I was a little bit more lean because I was working construction. So I wasn't as big anymore. Um, and anyway, bang, clothes, I would buy all the cool clothes and stuff like that. So I was cool looking. Right. Um, and I had really big, um, uh, wooden bead necklaces and things like that. And I remember running to the airport, just bawling. And then she's like, wait, and I turned around and she ran out of the taxi to me. And we had to hug again. We're like for like a minute. It was, it was so, it's such an incredible movie moment. It was really, really, it was good. It was the, the love was good. Like it was, I think people who have experienced that know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, I feel sad for you. Like, and that's not making fun of you. I mean, like, I hope people have always get to experience love like that. So Here's where shit gets a little bit dark and my past comes up to catch, catch up with me. So I get home and I'm on cloud nine and a youth pastor calls me into his office. He's like, can we meet some night, whatever, Wednesday or whatever? Uh, I want to meet with you. I get into the office and uh, so who's waiting there is the youth pastor who I loved and my girlfriend's dad. I'm like, what's going on? What's happening right now? So they're like, can you have a seat? And they sit me down and, uh, he, the youth pastor becomes the mediator at this point. Cause when you have a Christian thing, when you need to call your brother out on something, you need a mediator there. You need someone to do. So he was doing it biblically. Right. And he's like, I don't want you to see my daughter anymore. Just lay it right out. He's like, I don't want you to date my daughter anymore. I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> it's like, no, I mean, I'm, I'm 20. She's 19, almost 20. Like, 
no, you can't tell us what to do. And he's like, you're not yet. I want your scene anymore. I'm like, well, why? Like, what the hell is going on? Because didn't, we didn't have a problem with each other before. I knew that I wasn't the most loved kid because I was poor and I wasn't a legacy kid. And, you know, I didn't have anything to offer. I wasn't didn't have a good job. I had no prospects, nothing like that. But when I went to Vancouver, I signed up for school. I even paid, I think, a thousand bucks to mark my place in line. And I was going to go next semester. So I was ready to go. Um, and he didn't want that. So um, basically he said, yeah, I don't want you seeing her anymore because you didn't ask my permission to go see her when you went to school. I'm like, so? But he didn't, that's not the way it ran back in the day, right? You had to ask permission. You had to be that. I didn't, I didn't know. And the youth pastor was like, I didn't really take a side, but sort of did say, you just have to kind of agree to do this. And I just said, but I just said, F that I'm out of here. And I left, right? I'm like, I'm not, no, I'm not agreeing to anything. No way. I'm in like, I'm in deeply in love. Okay. So where are we at? Oh my gosh, this is such a long story. I might have to stop after this story. So anyway, long story short, she calls me balling her eyes out the next day. And she's like, we have to break up. I'm like, what are you talking? Why? And I like heard, she's like, my dad is, you know, forcing us to, I have to listen to my dad. I have to be, um, I have to listen to him. Basically when you're this, when you're a fundamental Christian and you're spot and sold to the church and everything, a part of it, you, you honor your parents over everything else. And if you become your own independent adult. So her dad said, you know, that's, it's a no go non-starter. You are not seeing him anymore and forced her to break up with me. And we're bawling our eyes out. Um, um, I mean, even the youth pastor came to me later. He's like, I'm really sorry that happened. That's inappropriate. Um, I don't even know what was going on. He just said that I didn't have his permission to go see the daughter. But I'll tell you what happened in a second. I, that I think I found out later. So I'm pissed. Everybody in the youth group's angry. Everybody's mad at the dad. The mom is think is mad at the dad. Everybody's mad at the dad because of what he forced me to do. I remember that lady that I lived with that they didn't want me living there anymore. We were still friends. Um, and you know, we were, they all, they didn't, they never abandoned me. They just didn't want me living there anymore. But they always like, always were like, how are you doing? All that kind of stuff. I remember her coming up to me at church one day and she said, I heard what he did to you and I'm pissed. And I was like, oh geez. But what I realized was because my porn looking at thing that got me removed from their house that spread around the church. I think that's to this day. I don't know why, but I'm pretty sure that's why her dad didn't want me dating her. Cause I looked at porn. I kid you not. So I mean, this is, again, this is fundamentalists. This is what I was too. I was the same. And that guilt of looking at that stuff haunted me to like for years and years and years and years until I realized that purity culture was a piece of shit, right? So um, that's what happened. So anyway, she's so heartbroken. She can't study. She can't focus on school. She's missing class. Everything's going wrong because this guy's a complete asshole for doing what he did. And so she flies her home without telling me so that she can have a face-to-face -face conversation with me about why. And we, after she shows up at youth group and I'm like, what the hell, what's going on? She's like, can we go for a walk? I'm like, yeah, let's go. And I, tr I hugged her and she hugged me and we just went on this walk. She's like, I have to break up with you because my dad doesn't want me seeing you. And that was it. There was no other excuse really. And she was just heartbroken. And I was like, okay, if that's how you, that's, if that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. I have to honor it. Like I loved her so much. I would do whatever to do not to stop her from crying. I didn't, I'm like, maybe this will happen in the future. Maybe we can revisit this, but she, she, that's kind of what we made plans to do. Like, let's revisit this. Let's try again. Like, let's figure it out. Meanwhile, not knowing in my head that I was never going to give him that grace or understanding or forgiveness ever. That was never going to happen. So, and she didn't know that either. So I was just, I was ruined by the way. I think I stopped going to church. I was like, I don't want to be at a church places, people like this, who are going to judge me like that. Like, I know I'm not, I'm not perfect. And I did, I was ashamed of my looking at the stuff in the computer and everything else. But the church literally ostracized me and ruined my life. And everything was so amazing up to the point. And then it just got, just fell down a big dark hole. And I was just like, I'm done. And then I remember the pastor and another elder coming out to meet me and saying, why aren't you coming to church anymore? I'm like, what do you mean? What the guy did to me? Like, I don't deserve this. I'm trying to be a better, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm trying to do good things with my life. I may not be rich or anything like that, but he just, he just basically ruined my life. And they're just like, we want you to see you come back. I'm like, I'm never coming back to that church ever again. And I never did. I went back for a funeral a couple times. That's it. Never stepped foot in that church ever again. And uh, everybody was heartbroken. It was a bad situation. She came back for the summer when I was, uh, I just went go, I went hard into work. Like I went real hard, like as much work as I got ripped. I got I got hugely shredded. Like I was big and I was lifting like 400 pound gutters. I was just like, I went into myself and I just pushed everything out the way I used to just went hard and just didn't talk to anybody. And I just worked and I was like, forget like life was garbage. So I worked and worked and worked and I got like 
yeah, I got real shredded. I got super tan. And then I moved in with a couple of Dutch guys um, in this old house on the highway and just kind of lived my life. And then when she got back for the summer, I said, okay, we're going to talk. And she got back and I was like completely different guy too. I was silent. I didn't go to church anymore. And she's like, can we talk? And she came over to the house and I remember this. And I said, well, are we going to give this another shot? And she's like, I really, really want to. Um, but she's like, and we were about to, I'm not kidding you. Not, I was like the movies. We're about, and she's like, I do want to. And we were hugging and just about to kiss. And I kid you not, her dad calls her cell phone and says, where are you right now? And she can't lie to her dad. And this is how I remember it anyway. And she's like, I have to go. He doesn't want me here. And that was the last time we ever spoke. For real. She drove away. Both of us crying. After making this decision to get back together. And then her dad stepped in again. Because he found out that she was hanging out with me. And said, nope. And that was it. That was it. That was like, that was it. Damn, that was it. Crazy. And to this day, I mean, I've spoken to her a couple of times. We've seen each other at a couple of funerals and stuff like that. But it took a long time to move on from that, obviously. Uh, really, really long time. I don't think I had another. My next relationship wasn't until I met my wife. 2000? 2001. Yeah, I was like 20, between 20 and 21 years old. And so I didn't, I, I told myself, I'm never going to date. I'm never going to get married. I'm not having kids. I'm just going to be this dude. I don't care anymore. I was like, I, I was so destroyed because then I, at this point, I realized in my life that the church... I had a realization of that the church and people inside the church didn't really want me. Nobody, again, this is a moment in my life where I, yeah, I did. I was wanted by this girl for sure. I knew I was, but everybody else saw me as someone that was less than like I was, I was less than I didn't have anything. I didn't have any prospects. I had no, I had a job, but I didn't have any money. I didn't have any family, nobody that I could call. I was just a nomad. I was again, all alone by myself. I had friends and stuff like that, but kind of out to the world to do nothing. So I'm just working my ass off, building greenhouses, um, going hard and just being lonely. And then this opportunity comes up to go to another school. A friend of mine from church says, Hey, look, there's a school in Saskatchewan. It's called, it's called Briarcrest. I think you'd really like it. Why don't you try giving that a shot? I know you like music. It's got a good music program. And then, uh, I said, okay, well, let me check it out. I signed up for it and I was accepted. And then I was like, okay, I'm leaving. I'm done with this place. I got to get out of here. And that's where we're going to end it today. So that was kind of my love story. I didn't actually think it was going to go that way because I had different notes. Well, that was it. That was my notes. <laughs> okay, good. So just a couple of, couple of like a couple of like um, things that kind of came to me during this filming of this episode was um, college, university, whatever it was. It was, called, it was called, allegedly called University College. It was called Redeemer University College. That's what it was called. It was an amazing moment of my life. It was very expensive and I did pay off my student loans until I was 35. Okay. I got myself into a whole shit ton of debt without realizing it. Well, I realized it, but I didn't realize how much it would affect me my whole life. But I'm glad I went. It changed who I was. I became someone different. My faith grew. And then I get back and then everything, you know, life happens. Love flourishes. These things are amazing. These memories are incredible. I mean, that's the summer of like uh, Armageddon. Okay. Titanic was a couple, I think the summer before. That was the summer of, uh, what was the movie? Uh, Frig, um, the Angels one. With the guy with the angel and the what's her face. Anyway, I forget what it was. But that was a summer of good movies, good good music. We would dance in the night, night. Like, it was so good. I remember it was great. But it was also a moment in my life where the church absolutely failed me. And the people inside the church completely failed me. And I was judged for my past, which, again, comes around to everybody. You are judged for your past. Um, that's kind of how that works. But I now that I look back on purity culture and the things that were looked down upon, um, that was crazy. Right. That's like, I mean, I'm pretty sure that guy probably looked up. <laughs> Guarantee you he did. Now I look back on everybody did. So, um, but it was just, again, I don't think it was even more. I think it was about that. Plus it was about the fact that I was a loser. And what I realized after that was that I was just more of a loser. Like I was like, I came out of that. I had hope for my life and then was shut down by this person who killed the hope I had for my life. And then I was a loser again. And there's this moment where we we're church hopping everywhere. We, I stopped going to that church, but I started going to other churches with friends to meet other girls because I was just kind of rebounding. And I'm like, let's go to all these other churches. It was a really, really bad place to be. It was a really lonely place for me too. Um, and then I decided to go to college. And then we'll pick it up after after going to college in Saskatchewan because um, there's some craziness. Because there's not like a ton of trauma past this point. Um, it's just me being an adult and my story continuing. So um, I guess that was kind of traumatic, but uh, I guess everybody goes through heartbreak. It's kind of a necessity in life to understand heartbreak. But to I'm glad I've loved and lost. I, I think the quote is, it's better to have loved and lost than not loved at all. And it was a good moment in my life. I'll never forget it. 
It was really good. And then I got to meet my wife. And there's some good stories there too. I'll tell you that. So whew, take a deep breath, everybody. It was good. Tell me your love story in the comments below. I love reading your comments on these stories. So many people have different versions of their stories. I love. So tell me in this one, what is your love story from a young, from a young age? Do you remember it? Does it still sit with you? How does it make you feel? Like are you, maybe you're still married to the person. I don't know. Really, really cool, interesting conversation. But again, don't forget your worth and your value, everybody. Even though sometimes we grow up and we think that, yeah, I'm a loser. I have no value because those around us made us feel that way. But let me say this. You never deserved to be made to feel like you're nothing, that you're a loser. And those people who did that to me, shame on them, right? I get that as a dad that you want the best for your daughter. I do get that. But I just got to point this out. I'm doing okay. I did good things with my life. Actually, of all the people from that church, okay, who were diehard Christians and everything else, I'm the only one who became a full-time pastor. I'm the only one who went to seminary. I'm the only one who studied the Bible. Okay, I'm the only one who became a pastor. Most of them don't even go to church anymore. So it's kind of funny to think that. I just want to let you guys know that nobody is a, should be able to make you feel the way that this person made me feel. You are valuable and incredible. Don't you ever forget it. And I'll see you tomorrow.